now, as is often the case, uh, a quick transition from El Nino to La Nina seems to be in the cards. Uh, this is how it looks now, but let's focus on the, the numbers here. And all of these charts represent the sea surface temperature anomalies in different parts of the eastern Atlantic Ocean. These areas here, uh, these charts rather, represent different uh, sectors of the eastern Atlantic uh, equatorial region, uh, sorry, the eastern Pacific equatorial region. Uh, the Nino 3.4 is the area where we are uh, most curious because that is the area that seems to have a higher correlation with atmospheric changes due to warmer than normal waters uh, in the eastern Pacific. And what you'll notice uh, in these three different regions, Nino 3, Nino 3.4, the most important, and then also Nino uh, 4, is the warming trend uh, well above normal. This is the difference from an uh, average. So the sea surface temperatures uh, anomalies, how much warmer than normal is it? It really peaked, all of these different regions peaked around the November, December period of last year. And since then, they've been still warmer than normal, but trending down. And we have noticed a more drastic drop over the last month or two, uh, taking us into the last readings that came uh, in early March. So still warmer than normal waters in the eastern equatorial Pacific but the trend is taking it cooler. Uh, you can actually look here at the Nino 3.4 region on the map, uh, and what you can see is while that area is still full of this warmer color, it is not as deep red as it once was as that cooling begins. And in fact, east of the Nino 3.4 region, we're starting to see some cooler than normal uh, waters uh, showing up. All this to say is that as we see the, uh, the temperature anomaly in the eastern Pacific starting to come down. We are seeing that rapid transition away from El Nino toward La Nina. And what this means is that while we're fully still in El Nino right now, uh, give us just a few months and we'll be quickly transitioning to first uh, Enso Neutral, which is where the waters in the eastern equatorial Pacific don't have any impact on the types of weather patterns that we see here. Uh, and then we quickly turn over just a few months later uh, to a very likely La Nina pattern. And just to, to give you a bit of time scale here, the bottom of the uh, chart are the months. And the way the Climate Prediction Center does this are in three month chunks that overlap because the science isn't a, a perfect science that we could say, hey, on this day, um, Enso is going to turn neutral or La Nina is going to begin. It sort of breaks it down on, on odds here. So AMJ means April, May, June is when the expectation is that we would go from El Nino to uh, Enso neutral here. So April, May, June, that three-month window, the chances of a neutral pattern are over 80%. But then June, July, August is when the odds of La Nina start to really ramp up. And we could follow this out all the way to the right. And you could see here, October, November, December. So into next winter, the odds of La Nina still way up there, almost at a 90% chance of La Nina happening. And this is very common for La Nina uh, to follow uh, El Nino very quickly. So with that, it looks like there's a good chance that La Nina is going to set in the summertime. I mean, mm -hmm. right, like smack dab in the summertime. Yeah. What what is what is that going to do um, to to the weather around here? Like, what kind of impacts can we expect uh, here in Central Texas, Nick? Sure. So yeah, June, July, August on this chart. Um, so end of spring into summer, La Nina is favored, and that also coincides with the beginning of Atlantic hurricane season on June first. So the uh, typical impacts that we notice from La Nina and El Nino uh, affect us more in the wintertime, but there are some things that we can pull out on different seasons uh, that, uh, that are some impacts there too. And what we can see during uh, La Nina hurricane season is typically more hurricanes in the, uh, call it the, the majority of the Atlantic, especially where... Um, 
the majority of these tropical storms form. The MDR, the main development region, is typically uh, warmer. There's also a more vertical uh, or weaker vertical wind shear uh, and trade winds and less atmospheric stability, uh, which means more instability, which helps storms to grow. So in this area here, more hurricanes are expected. Now in the eastern Pacific, fewer hurricanes uh, expected during the hurricane season. So this would mean here a more active Atlantic hurricane season. And we're also seeing still very warm waters in the Atlantic, which would only help uh, to develop more of those storms. Now the question remains, okay, but what about the Gulf? You can get more storms in the Atlantic, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get a lot more development happening in the Gulf. But what can happen is storms develop uh, in the main development region of the Atlantic and then travel into the Gulf of Mexico. So if there's more storms here, you would think that the odds are a little higher for more storms to eventually uh, enter the Gulf of Mexico. Not necessarily develop in the Gulf and move in, but develop in further out in the Atlantic and potentially move in. So uh, it's not to say that we're guaranteeing you a more active uh, Gulf tropical uh, season here this uh, spring into summer, but the odds are in favor of more storms in the Atlantic, and that would tend to lean toward more activity entering the Gulf of Mexico and potentially, uh, therefore, meaning more uh, active uh, tropics here in the Gulf of Mexico, too. So, I mean, b basically, like, it's just a sort of sort of like a like sort of like a, a circumstance we're doing. I mean, obviously, more more storms in the Caribbean and the Atlantic have just a better chance of making it our way. Yeah, yeah. right. And, uh, you know, some of that's just going to be dependent on the path that they take. But if there's more in the Atlantic overall, your odds that sure. more of them make it to the Gulf yeah. are, are higher. I also want to dive into next winter. I know we're um, barely into uh, spring <laughs> here now. But we uh, are already seeing good signs that La Nina is going to be with us at least into the beginning of next winter. And as you probably know, not this past winter, but the three winters before were all La Nina, and they helped to contribute to such uh, prolonged drought that we've been having because La Nina winters are typically drier and warmer for us here in Central Texas. Um, so we can get an early outlook that we really need to get as much rain as we can this spring uh, and maybe some beneficial rain from the tropics this summer before we head into another potentially drier than normal winter this coming winter, uh, because otherwise the drought would just get worse and we've already had our own issues with um, water uh, scarcity and, and figuring out where uh, more water is going to come from as our local population continues to, uh, to grow as people move here, Billy. And with that drier than normal uh prediction there does that also mean perhaps warmer like 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 hotter or, or, or kind of like how, how how do those sort of things kind of kind of correlate with with a la nina pattern like yeah this? so it does usually mean warmer um but if you remember the last three la nina winters we still had some pretty brutal arctic outbreaks of uh not just cold but several deep freezes we had ice storms we had snowstorms in La Nina. And part of that reason is, is that while overall during the winter we may be warmer than normal, the air to the north of us in a La Nina winter is usually colder than normal. Okay, that's fine for us if that colder than normal air stays there. But when we get Arctic fronts that uh, drop all the way through Texas, it can bring in that colder than normal air from the north. Uh, and while it might just be small spells of brutal cold, it can actually mean uh, that our cold can be colder in a La Nina winter than in, say, an El Nino winter. If you think this past winter, um, we didn't, you know, we had very few brushes with with icing, light freezes. Uh, it was overall relatively quiet from a winter weather perspective. Uh, sure, we had some extra rain, especially in January, uh, but we didn't see uh, accumulating snow. Uh, in any place that I can remember. We had very little in the way of, uh, of iciness, except maybe one day there was the, a little bit of that. So, um, so we could still get Arctic and even more uh, cold outbreaks mm -hmm. during a La Nina winter, even if the winter as a whole 
is uh, warmer than normal. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it. There's all sorts of good info about El Nino and La Nina, how El Nino is headed out yeah. of here. And La Nina is, is uh, making its way in here uh, fairly quickly uh, from, a, from a meteorological standpoint anyway. Yeah. I uh, mean, spring only just begun, and we're right. talking end of spring. Uh, we'll already have gone from El mm -hmm. Nino now to, to La Nina real quick. And, uh, and, Nick, you also have a little bit of a uh, extended spring uh, forecast outlook for us. Yeah. How, how about you take us into that? So uh, we're going to talk about April real quick. Uh, usually a month ahead outlook would be something I would dive deeper into. Um, but because the pattern is not pointing drastically one way or another, I, I feel like it was a good little bonus to add to this chat here. Uh, the, but the April outlook came out from the Climate Prediction Center, putting most of Central Texas in this near normal category here. But as you get into the um, hill country, as far as rainfall anyway, looking drier than normal as you get west of 35, which is, of course, is not good news. That's where we need the rain the most uh, in the hill country. And from a temperature perspective for the month of April, again, we're on the fringes here of warmer than normal to the west, meaning the hill country up until about 35 in Austin, and then east of 35, leaning toward near normal. But remember, whenever you're on these borderline uh, zones here, uh, you know, it's not going to be as accurate as to say, oh, what side of the line am I on? You're still leaning toward near normal, if not maybe slightly above normal. There's not huge signs pointing either way. Uh, and, and just to refresh what is normal in April is highs uh, that end up when you average out the month near 80 and lows of about 59. And it's usually one of our drier months, despite the fact that May is our wettest month of the year. April averages are third driest with 2.42 inches of rain. Now, it, it also is a severe weather month for us. So when it does rain, we can get some pretty nasty storms, large hail damaging winds and, and tornadoes. But it is not usually a very wet month for us. Yeah, those maps really didn't do Austin any favors, like no. splitting it in half, <laughs> like trying, right. to, trying to trying to figure out like what might happen and what might not happen. I mean, it's basically, I mean, according to those maps, kind of seems like a coin flip at this point. Yeah, it, it's close enough to be either we end up with a normal month yeah. from both a rain and temperature perspective, or maybe it's a little warmer, a little drier. So it's not pointing yeah. the way that we would like it, which would be wetter and most people would right. probably want it cooler <laughs> uh but um yeah there are some signs that as we head into april some of our longer term uh computer guidance does bring in a, a bit of rain for us now of course we don't want it to rain on april 8th either billy as right? much as yeah, we can't have that. Uh, want the rain because we don't want those clouds yeah. around eclipse day yeah. uh right uh, and i should mention that we are tracking the potential for some uh strong if not severe storms overnight tonight uh in the hill country uh, just before or near midnight, and then heading into the metro a few hours after that. So uh, it's not a our biggest threat that we've had here so far this season, and some of these storms will be mm -hmm. likely weakening as they move east, but it is something that we'll be talking about on KXA News at 5 and 9 and 10. So uh, plenty to talk about today, but we did want to give you this extended yeah. look. Yeah, yeah, potential for a little overnight storms. Uh, we've, we've had those a few few nights Recently, yeah. yeah. A lot of nights when we've uh, had to figure out some uh, meteorological team overlap here in the middle of the night to see how storms do. But uh, these ones we expect will be weakening mm -hmm. as we get through the night, uh, but so mm -hmm. giving us about a quarter inch to an inch of rain in some spots. Any rain is good rain at this Any point, right? Any rain is good rain, yeah. especially in the middle of the night and not on Eclipse Day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it, to, to stay informed on all things weather, uh, be sure to uh, stay with KXAN.com. Uh, stay with us on air. Uh, KXM, like Nick said, we're, we're on 5, 9, and 10 today. And uh, and whenever severe weather hits, turn, turn on KXM. Here and, we are. And we will, we will give you the most uh, accurate and updated forecasts of anybody here in Austin. Yeah, we've got a blog on the uh, majority of what we talked about today. Uh, the uh, switch from El Nino to neutral and then La yes. Nina. Uh, and uh, so that's all for you on uh, KXAN.com already. And Billy, I know you've got a busy day ahead of you, too. I do. I do. I have to lead my other life and cover some uh, UT women's basketball here tonight and then keep track of that race out of Coda that's going on right now, the NASCAR yeah. Cup Series uh, in town. So, yeah, busy, busy sports day for me as soon as we're done here. Good stuff. Well, I appreciate the time, Billy, and uh, you at home as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. This will end this edition of Nick's First Warning. And for Nick Bannon, I'm Billy Gates. Thanks again for watching. 
We will talk to you again very, very soon.